there is no reason to be dressed up like this. It's basically the motorsport version of cosplay. I remember sitting in this garage apartment I was living in at the time, and I was watching the first season of Stranger Things, and I was laying out the designs for this car, and it was one of the best times of my life. I had fallen in love with, with driving open wheel cars. I got to do some training at Laguna Seca in the Skip Barber cars. I'd driven some Formula Fords, and then I, I was racing a Formula 500. And the experience of driving an open wheel car, it's just so amazing. I'm sure if you drive motorcycles, you know something even better. But for people not brave enough to do that, like me, an open wheel car, the, the, the feedback, the control, what the car is capable of doing, even without aero. I didn't have a lot of money, but I kept seeing deals on eBay or Craigslist or, or different racing forums where like a vintage uh, Formula Junior or Formula Ford Lotus went for ten dollars or $12,000. And it was because it had the wrong engine in it or something wasn't right or it was missing something uh, or it had some damage or it wasn't a Lotus. It was some other car from the period that was you know, basically a Lotus copy. And an uncompetitive, you know, an old Formula Ford, something that's not competitive, they're like seven, they were seven or $8,000 at the time. But once something becomes vintage, then it's like $60,000, which that's out of the question, never gonna afford that. But these $10,000 ones, I kept seeing them happen. I thought, you know, I could aspire to that. I could save up and, and, and do that. And I could sell stuff and, and, and I could afford to do this. I started shopping for them and I kept missing deals. It would be like something would come up and I'd go to see it. And as I was like, oh, it sold yesterday, sorry. Or something would be on eBay and I'd kind of bid, bid on it up to $10,000. And it would go beyond that. And I was like, well, this, this is probably gonna go for $20,000. So I give up and it would sell for 10,500. <laughs> so in a fit of frustration, I just decided I was gonna build my own car. And if I'm gonna build my own car, I'm not gonna go with a little four cylinder. I'm gonna build the kind of car that you read about in the history books. And I'm gonna put a V8 in it just to make this completely nuts. I'm gonna do it on the $10,000 budget that I had for buying something. And, and it's not gonna be a two, frame car, I'm going to make a monocoque. Because you read all the books and they all talk about what a revolution it was when the monocoque came. So I picked the Lotus 38. And more people are probably familiar with the Lotus 49, the Formula One car. I had a couple reasons for doing this. On a practical level, a 49 needs its engine to be a stressed member of the chassis, meaning there is no chassis past here. The engine and the gearbox hold the rear suspension. That means $10,000 in an engine, and I'm trying to spend that in the whole car. The other thing is I actually think the 38 is better looking in the sense that it's just, it looks more muscular, less dainty, maybe less sophisticated, but hey, this is America. We, we do these kind of things. I had actually seen the Jim Clark's winning 38 at the Pebble Beach Concours in, I think, 2010. I had no idea I was going to build one one day. I was just, I love this car. Uh, you know, it's an open wheel Lotus. It's, it's an Indy 500 winner. It looks just awesome. And I took a ton of, ton of pictures. It was fresh from its restoration, so it looked immaculate. Len Terry, who designed the 38 and went on to, well, he designed a bunch of things, but the, he also designed the AAR Eagle Indy car and F1 car, which if you look at, looks a heck of a lot like the 38, just a little prettier with uh, the, the Eagle beak nose. He wrote a book and he goes into his opinions on how things should be done and, and what he looks for. He was really big on roll centers. That's where I got into roll centers, was he was big on tuning with roll centers. So anyways, in his book, I could read about, about his ideas, his philosophies. He gets into details, not like, here's the blueprint of this specific car, but here's generally what your front upright dimensions will be. You should have your rear roll center higher than the front. If you're making a car out of tube steel, here's the thicknesses you should use and the diameters. If you're making a monocoque out of aluminum, here's the gauges you should use and wear. Here's the types of metals. It's just an amazing resource. So I had to simplify a number of things on the car, mainly to, to my fabricating ability. Len Terry designs these really intricate front subframe bulkhead things that are form sheet metal and, and they look beautiful 
but he even lists them as taking 80 man hours. And I took inspiration from other race cars, even the Lotus 49, the 72, the 77, they've got tube steel front structures. And I was like, that's something I can do. Uh, that it won't be a question mark in the build of like, not sure I can do that, but we'll give it a shot. This was, no, I can, I can do that. Another thing is the car should be an aluminum structure all the way to the rear bulkhead. Mine stops here and I have triangulated steel in the back. That's because I'm chicken. And that was a common sentiment at the time when monocoques were coming into fashion, uh, people would still do parts of it with more steel than they needed because they knew tube steel would work. And in mine, because I've got this road car transmission, it needs to be supported a little further back. And normally on a 38, the rear bulkhead is before the output shafts. On mine, it has to be behind it. And having just a triangulated tube structure in there means I've got an opening for the drive shafts to go through. It's probably more than you want to know, but I'm just trying to you know, explain my excuses for why I didn't copy it exactly. Obviously the, the roll hoop here looks different. That's partly so it'll be taller, but it also has to do with the structure here. Kind of a, a favorite hobby that, that came out of this was in doing this, there's still so much you have to figure out where you either don't know what it is they did on the original car, or you know and, and you know you can't do that. And so I would come up with different solutions for how I was gonna make this bulkhead and, and all kinds of different things. And then I would think well, like, I haven't seen this on another race car. Maybe there's a reason why guys didn't do it this way. Uh, you know, I don't know what I don't know. And something that just felt so good is I'd go to vintage races and I'd go around and look at the cars and, and go, hey, that, that's a, a Tyrrell that Jackie Stewart won the championship in, in 69 with, and its bulkhead is made the way I was talking about making it. Or the, the way the, the structure is around the rear suspension or, you know, just something like that and realizing hey, maybe I'm not a complete idiot. And there was just a lot of validation, a lot of encouragement that came from looking at things like that. Because as much as possible, if I wasn't borrowing from the Lotus 38, I was trying to get my, my ideas from other race cars in the period. So, you know, it's not that it's completely faithful to a Lotus 38, but it's completely faithful to how cars were made in that period, as much as I can do with safety requirements today. And this isn't as safe as a modern car would be. It's also not as unsafe as a period car would have been. The other major simplification I made is Len Terry draws the most beautiful cars and they all have compound curves, which means the metal's formed, it's got curves in three dimensions. And I knew I wasn't gonna be able to do that. I actually bought a cheap English wheel from Harbor Freight and I've done some cool things on it, but just screwing around. If you said, okay, you need to make this exact shape on one side, and then you need to make a matching shape for the other side, and it's gonna be close enough that you'll be able to look at it and tell if one side's wonky compared to the other, I knew that was just gonna drive me insane. So I thought, well, let me see if I can do this with just, just wrapping sheet metal without it having to, to curve in three dimensions. So I did a mock-up in paper using graph paper. And, and this helped because I was already laying out the, the dimensions for the inner panels and whatnot. But then I could make the outer skin and see, does this look like a monocoque car from the 60s? And it looked like it enough that, hey, if I can do that in paper, I can do it with sheet metal and this is gonna, this is gonna work. I did it in a dog run. Uh, I like working outside anyways, but it was kind of the only space I had. It, it was on the side of this garage and it was a yard, but it was seven feet across by, I don't know, 12 feet long. And it was just enough room to, to build the tub. I made a little wood table-like thing that, to, to work on it on and drilled a couple thousand holes, put a couple thousand rivets in. I didn't have a long metal break for, for bending metal, so it was a lot of bending by hand and when I had to with a hammer. I tried to avoid using a hammer because my, I had neighbors on each side within mere feet of where I was and I didn't really want to disturb them. Bending the metal this way involves a lot of patience and strength and swearing. It doesn't always work. The longer and thicker a piece is, the more it just feels like it's impossible. Like you're draining a pool with an eyedropper. Then once the central part was done, which was the bulk of the aluminum work, uh, I thought the car was probably going to be too long to get out of the dog run. 
if I did anymore. So a friend came by and we just picked it up and carried it into the driveway. And then I just completed the rest of it in the driveway. And the bulk of that was doing the steel structure I did for the rear third of the car around the engine for the rear suspension. I'd already done the, the front one. That's what we carried it by. And then putting the suspension all together and plumbing the brakes and, and uh, of course doing the gearbox and the gearbox mounts and then painting it and then dropping the engine and that was all just done in the driveway. Again, I'm not sure what my neighbors thought. Some of them thought it was cool. I don't know about all of them, but hey, I'm gone now, so they're fine. Uh, the nose, first version of the nose I did in aluminum and it was an offense to anybody with eyes. Basically, I had an argument with the metal over what shape it should be in and I lost. I found though that it made a good stand if I sat it on its end and just put tools on it while I worked on other things. So the metal not working, I decided to make one out of fiberglass and I used some wood and some metal to make kind of a rough cone shape that I, I wrapped some fiberglass around. And then once I had that shape, I built it up, just built up more layers inside and out, and then had to do quite a bit of filler on the outside to make it smooth. Even that took a couple tries. And when it was done, it didn't have any compound curves, but it did kind of complete the shape of the car. And, and it looked good. I didn't look correct for a Lotus 38, but it looked like I had a cool open wheeler. And <laughs> after the first nose, anything was better. So originally the car was painted blue and white and I had painted other cars before. They had all been fiberglass panels. And when I painted this one, I did the nose cone first, came out fine as well as could be expected. But then I found I just got horrible orange peel when I painted the aluminum, just the, the way the heat transfer was while the paint was curing, I assume. It was a sealer, a, a color coat, and then a clear coat. And I just thought, oh, I can either color sand the crap out of this going through all the different rivets and really the orange peel was so bad that I was pretty sure I was just going to burn through the clear coat completely. Or I could just cover it up with stickers. So we covered it in funny stickers. My original plan for the suspension was I wanted to get the uprights and the brakes and, and the general components at each corner from a GD40 replica. I was hoping I could go to like Tornado or something and buy a set of their suspension. I don't know if they'd sell that to me or not, uh, but that was the plan. But that meant sending off to England and it was going to be expensive. It was a major portion of the budget. And of course, as the build is progressing, I realized the budget's not going to be enough. And, and one of the first things I, I started doing was, okay, where can we save money so that we can put money somewhere else? A big thing turned out to be the front suspension. I was looking at the front spindles that guys had on, on GD40s and other cars. And then I started looking through Speedway Motors catalog and they, they sell racing parts and they sell a lot of stuff for hot rods. And I found that they had these Mustang II uprights because a lot of guys use a Mustang II base suspension. Because hot rod guys were using them, there was a ton of options. You could get bigger brakes for them. You could get them with a one inch suspension drop, a two inch suspension drop. And looking at it, it's like, well, this doesn't look that different than what I would get from one of the kit cars. So I thought, well, I'm going to do that and that saved me a ton of money. So I had that going for the front, but that meant, okay, I have to figure something out for the rear. So I looked at what guys on the internet were doing. Something a lot of Cobra guys were using were Thunderbird knuckles from, it's like a 97 Cobra. And uh, the, the SVT Mustang Cobra in around 99, 2000 used it too. And so that meant I could get Mustang SVT Cobra size rear brakes. The downside is that meant my suspension ended up looking a little funky because the shape of the knuckle is quite a bit different than the shape of an upright on a car like this would have had, which the GD40 ones would have been much closer to. I've seen other guys actually fabricate their own. And when I started this, I was really leery about doing any kind of fabricating on the actual suspension. So that was out of the question. Now, that's something we could try. Uh, that's, I should really step up to that. That would open up a lot of possibilities, make, make some design things better in the chassis where I've had to do weird things because I'm using these modern suspension components that were meant for a road car. So what happened with the rear suspension, I bought, I bought these knuckles almost out of desperation because I needed something that would work. And I put them on and I clearly haven't really thought this through. You know, I'd modeled the suspension using the rough 
design of what the GT40s were using, and suddenly the mounting points on these knuckles is way different, and, and just bolting it on, you look at, at how the uh, suspension arms, the control arms, uh, the angles they're at, and I realize, oh, this isn't gonna work. And I think, I think I was lifting it up and down and watching the camber change, and it was, it was going the wrong way. And so then I kind of, in desperation, did some quick modeling and figured out that if I drilled some new holes, originally the, the upper control arms were supposed to share the bolt with the upper shock mount, which I don't think they did on the 38, but Lowe's did on a lot of cars, the whole simplify and add lightness, the use the same part to do multiple functions philosophy. But I ended up having to, to ditch that and, and drill a lower hole. The suspension geometry still, still looks a little extreme, but it actually, if you model it, it's as far as the tire being in contact with the road, it's doing the correct thing. The roll center's in the correct spot. Uh, it just looks funny. And it looks particularly funny now because these are bigger tires than I meant for it to have. And in order to get a decent ride height now, <clears throat> they're at an even more extreme angle, which lowers the roll center and doesn't hurt. I, I mean, uh, it went through some development. Yeah, that's because, yeah. The rockers on the front originally were off of 80s Formula Ford. What's on there now, I made, and they're not too pretty at the moment. Uh, these are just kind of prototypes, but I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit. Along with the suspension that I was hoping to get from Tornado, the other thing I wanted was they've got a Citron gearbox, transaxle, that they've made their own bell housing so it'll bolt right up to a, a Windsor small block, uh, no adapter required. Uh, they, they do some other modifications to improve the oiling and strengthen it a little bit. And, you know, a, a proper gearbox for this, you're looking at around $10,000 and, and not easily sourced in, in the U.S. I thought the Citron one was going to be around $3,000, and, and that was, you know, one of the biggest parts of the budget. And I started talking to them, and, and it seemed like, oh, well, it's $3,000. Uh, plus you have to pay for the bell housing. Like I thought the whole point was it came with the bell housing. Like, oh no, that's extra and this is extra and we can't tell you how much shipping is. And I said, well, I need to know. So I need to know if I've got enough money to buy it. While this was going on, I started just hunting around for some other solution. I found a guy on GD40s.com selling an Audi 016 box that came out of a, a GD40 replica and it had the adapter plate and everything. And I think it was 1600 bucks. And I was just like, sold. So I got that, that's what's in here. The price was the major upside. The downside was the gearbox had a couple differences. For one thing, the, the gear selector was on the other side and that created some headaches in how I did the, the gear linkage. The bigger problem was the shape of the gearbox. It's got more of a bulge on the bottom and it wouldn't actually fit in the subframe I made. Well, it would if you just raised everything way up but of course that raises the center of gravity and that's, that's a race car no-no. So originally what I did was I just cut the rear bulkhead and made a stupid looking thing come down that I'm sure aerodynamically would have been terrible, but these aren't aero cars. I did that just because I needed it to work. You know, a flawed solution is still a solution or my favorite way of saying it is if it's stupid and it works, it's not stupid. But that's how it was for the first, I don't know, four or five years. The engine is, I think, one of the, the more amazing things that happened in this build. I found a guy on an SCCA forum in the area who said, hey, I've got a 302 short block uh, free to an interesting project. And I said, I've got an interesting project. I think I was the first person to respond and he was just like, hey, come pick it up, it's yours. And what he had was, he had a Cobra replica that he had been autocrossing and he had this engine, it was from a 89 Mustang-ish, you know, somewhere around that era. And he got a stroker short block to put in his Cobra. And so he took the heads off and the intake and you know, all the top of the engines, all, all the things that aren't the block and pistons and cam, and, and put them on his new short block and put that in the Cobra. And so I just had this you know, stock short block. And then for lightness more than performance, I got aluminum heads, aluminum intake manifold, aluminum carburetor. I wasn't really interested in a lot of horsepower because I'm using that Audi gearbox and it has been strengthened a little bit, but that kind of just moves what's going to break to the next part. And, and this is out of an Audi 5000 and I'm running uh, 
300 something foot pounds of torque through it now, even with, with a mild cam. So, you know, I could build a better motor easily, but what would that do other than rip my gearbox apart? You know, you, you, you're not any faster if the car won't move. So I got the engine in, I put fluids in, everything's plumbed, put a couple gallons of gas in, and the weight came in just 1,400 pounds, which is, I don't know, 50 pounds heavier than the original Lotus would have been. And I knew I overbuilt a few things on purpose. There's things that I just don't want to deal with having to break, and things I don't want to be wondering while going 110 miles an hour down the front straight at Laguna Seca. Hey, you know, that one part, I'm kind of thinking it's a little questionable now. Maybe, maybe, it's actually, you're not going to think about it then, you're going to think about it the night before. So I'm pretty happy with the weight. And the final cost at this point was $12,000. So from the original goal, I failed. But this for $12,000, I, I think it's worth it. You know, it's easy to goad yourself that, that little extra money when it's something like, hey, if I spend $500 more, I've got a Lotus 38. Whereas at the start, it's like, well, it's $500 for parts that might come together into something. I don't know. We'll see if it works. But you get near the end and it's easy to say, no, no, no I just, just I write this one more check and I've got a Lotus 38. And then for that $12,000, I got the most likes and comments I've ever gotten on a Facebook post. So front to back, here's what I used. Radiator, got it off eBay. The steering rack is a stiletto steering rack. It's a 12 to one ratio. So nice and quick. I had to make extensions to get the bump steer right and they're adjustable so I can adjust that. I started off with this and then I put that steering rack on the GT40 with some different extensions because it just, it works so well. And so now I've got the new Gen 5 stiletto rack, which is even nicer. It's pricier, but it's still half the price of any normal rack for an open wheel car. Pedals and master cylinders are Willwood. The front spindles are Mustang II style with a two inch drop and 11 inch brakes. Gauges are various things from Summit. Steering wheel and shifter, I got used off of Zinc Formula Ford. It's got an ATL fuel cell, Ford 302, Ford aluminum heads, uh, Edelbrock intake manifold, polycarb, Mustang headers, these are like 80 bucks a piece, and they're just upside down. Gearbox is an Audi 016. It's got a little strengthening in the back. It's got custom drive shafts. Rear uprights are Thunderbird knuckles from late 90s with Mustang SVT 10 and a half inch brakes. When I started, one of the things I told myself to give myself confidence, because I never expected it to work, and I told myself, that's fine, you've got your entire life. I'll just keep working on it until it works. So I'll build it, if something doesn't work, we'll take that apart and we'll do it, we'll do it better the next time. But to explain just how much I assumed it, it wouldn't work, when you're building it, these pieces of aluminum, you can just flop them around and it seems like, I'm gonna put a lot of weight in this thing, I don't see how this is gonna hold together. And so when I put the engine in and the gearbox, I then, got in the cockpit and just started jumping up and down on it a little bit because I was pretty sure the car would just go and I would rather it do that in the driveway than while I was driving it. But you know, it didn't. And, and when, I, when I put it on the scales to weigh it and do the corner balancing, uh, the scales, you know, you're up about this high. And afterwards I purposely, it was in neutral and I just pushed the car so it would roll off and go down the scales. And again, thinking like, I think it's gonna break, but I'd rather it broke in the driveway than while I was on track. Uh, so I pushed it off and it was so satisfying to see it go thump, and you can see all the suspension work and it just comes right back up and it doesn't, the, the shocks dampen the, the spring motion. And that was really cool. That was this moment of, well, this might just work and this is gonna be a lot of fun. So I took it to its first autocross, it was August or October at this point. And one of the things that I thought was really cool, my son, I think he's a little spoiled with race cars because I was always around a lot of race cars. I raced with the SCCA and that meant I knew a lot of people at racing events, even though my racing was, was really low level. Uh, we could go to vintage events and I knew people and so my kid would get to sit in their cars and whatnot. And he was just around a lot of things. I don't think he realized how special it was. And you know, I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is just amazing that I've lucked into this. And for him, it's just a normal day. He was with me for the first event and, and we're, we're towing the car from Santa Cruz to the events at, we used to do autocrosses at the Marina Airport, which was a super great location uh, to have fun with cars. 
and uh, there's kind of a slight chance of rain. And at the time, I didn't have any air cleaner on the carburetor, it was just open. And I kind of said, you know, if it's raining, I've got a cover on it for, for while we're going down. I said, if it's raining, we might, I might not be able to, to drive because I don't want to get water sucked into the engine. And my son says, well, maybe if it's just raining a little bit, you could drive. And the fact that he would say that suddenly showed me, oh, hey, he's actually interested in this and he wants to see this car perform. So that, that meant something to me. So we get out there, uh, I've got it, I've purposely got it on the, the wheels and tires I rolled it around with when I built it, which are not light. The tires are big, they're road tires, they're not grippy, that's on purpose. Because if I have any problems, I want them to happen at a slow speed. I want to test it slowly and make sure the suspension mounts aren't gonna rip out or something like that. Um, I don't want a lot of grip right now. And I wanted, I wanted the car tall, I wanted it up. So that when I hit the brakes really hard for the first time, the nose didn't slam into the ground or something. You know, I, I, don't, I don't really know what it's gonna do. We haven't done chassis training. It's never driven before. Uh, and that's another funny thing. This has happened more than once where I do a car and I come out and people are like, like, oh, you're gonna go for fastest time of the day? I'm like, no, I'm gonna trumble around at 45 miles an hour and hope I don't explode. If I get home in one piece, it's been a successful day. Put it another way. I know the idiot who built this and I don't trust him. So I get in the car, I'm ready for my first run. And this other woman, Audrey, who I know, who's a lot, a lot of fun, comes over and says, I just want you to know you're crazy. And I couldn't pass up the opportunity. So I lift up my visor and say, you know, that might be the last thing anybody ever says to me. <laughs> so I get out there, I drive it around, it doesn't blow up. So, oh, this is great, let's go a little faster. I go a little faster. I find that off throttle, the, the tail wants to come around. I get a big spin. And of course, it's a, it's a fun group of guys to all across with. So people are like, woo! Just to give you an example of how stupid I can be. Uh, it turned out the rear toe was wrong. I wanted it to be fairly stable for its first time out. So I gave it what I thought was a fair amount of toe in, like, like um, three sixteenths, maybe a quarter inch of toe in. And I don't know what was distracting me when I did it, but uh, I gave it toe out. So you lift off the throttle and whoa, the tail comes around, which I later learned because the car's kind of long uh, and, and isn't, doesn't have great turn in because of that. I, I later learned to not run a lot of rear toe so that you can rotate the car that way. So stupid mistake, but it taught me something. That first event was near the end of the year. And so the next year, it's the Golden Gate Lotus Club and they had a class for Lotus open or Lotus Unlimited or something like that. And it was for finished race cars or Lotus 7 clones that are, you know, way too extreme. You know, you, you can have a, a, an LS V8 in a Lotus 7. So th this was the class for people who had pretty extreme machines. Uh, and I was able to get this in with a little, little arguing with the organizers. I then got these Hoosier tires. I, I got these particularly because they're used in vintage racing. They're, they're slicks with, with grooves cut in. Remember, cars like this didn't run on slicks. Slicks came later to road racing. These are probably really great tires on a heavier car. They're better on, I built a GT40 replica and they're better on that. Uh, even that I, I, I think is a little too light for them though. I really need to step up to some sticky rubber. I came from, from you know, Hoosier R25B uh, rubber, it's R25A, whichever one was the softer, which that stuff is, is really like chewing gum. I mean, that's not uh, an exaggeration. But, but once these were on and I took the car out, suddenly it was like a race car. Now, not a very good race car, but it, it, it handled, and it handled better than I really expected. I mean, first time I've built a car, I'm building it to a design that's antiquated. I mean, there's building it, you, you, you look at what they did and you try to understand why they were, were doing that because in modern terms, people wouldn't do that. So, it was really amazing. And you can see in pictures how pumped I am after a couple runs, because like, hey, this thing's coming alive. It handles, it, it's, it needed tuning. It still has the problem that because I made it so I would fit in it and I didn't get clever with how I packaged my feet, I just made the car longer, it's too long. I, I'm sure that makes it nice and stable at a really high speed that I haven't gotten it up to yet, but it makes it so there's just so little weight on the front it's really front grip limited. And the only way to tune it so you're not just understeering everywhere 
is to make the back crap as well so that you just have, you don't have much grip anywhere. And it makes it fun. So over the next four years, I won the championship for the class four times by showing up more than anybody else. Uh, it's kind of an attendance award at that point. At the first event where I had the wheels and tires, there, there's another thing and, and you'll see, I, I call this, I called it with, with the GT40 build too, I call it how I didn't build this car from scratch. And that's for two reasons. One, just like the GT40 build, this isn't a tool room copy of a Lotus 38. It's something that roughly looks like one. But on the other hand, I had this car at an event and, and there's this other guy there who, who runs a Lotus race shop and, and he's looking at it and he's asking questions and he's got his young son there and his son's asking, well, what's the make? You know, what, what kind of car is this? And so his dad says, well, it's his, he made it. And, and the kid looks at it and goes, well, the engine says Ford. He didn't make that. And <laughs> I had to go. Yeah, I mean, I assembled the engine, but no, I didn't forge the block or the, yeah. So no, I didn't build it from scratch. <laughs> it's always nice when, when kids put you in your place. So now that I've been driving it for a while, my kids get, has gotten really into motorsport. He watches Formula One racing with me, but he expresses that uh, he likes the car, but he likes modern Formula One cars better. And, and so when we talk about building something else one day or maybe building him something, uh, he's like, well, I, I want a modern car. And I'm like, uh, you know, I don't have an autoclave for, for doing carbon fiber. But he was interested in this and I thought, well, you know, there, you don't, there's other ways to do carbon fiber. You don't need an autoclave. You can do vacuum bagging. You can do it just like, like fiberglass, lay, laying it up by hand and, and getting stuff that cures at a, a lower temperature. So I thought, you know what, let's, let's look at this and I want to make a better nose that makes this car look like the car it's meant to look like. So I made this nose out of carbon fiber and, and this is much lighter. And it's not that the carbon fiber is that much lighter, it's that I, I made it better and then it needed less you know, filler, uh, sealer stuff on top to make it look smooth. That took a couple tries uh, and it, it's still not perfect, but I think it really stepped up the way it looked. And then shortly after that, I got to take it to its first track day at Laguna Seca. And it rained, and it, it rained heavily. So I took it out. I remember going around turn three, and it was this really amazing lighting where the sun broke through the clouds a little. It's still sprinkling, but the sun broke through the clouds a little bit, and there was this kind of golden hue, like something out of a motivational poster. And I've been in other open wheel cars, but something about sitting in this just looks so amazing watching the the apex curbing come up on on turn three and, and my front wheel hit in the curbing and i'm going slow even but it's just like oh my gosh this is amazing and that image is burned in my head and i hope i never forget it being wet um i'm leaving it in a higher gear than i need to and i'm just fine it's got a ton of torque i come out of turn 11 which is like a 30 or 40 mile yeah 35 mile an hour turn and i just left it in fourth and I hit the gas and, and I'm just slowly squeezing the gas and it's going like, like the engine doesn't know there's a car that it has to pull. And I was thinking, oh, I'll just use third and fourth to, so I don't have to worry about accidentally spinning out in the wet. And now I'm thinking, oh, I'm just, just use fourth. And I'm coming down the front straight and I, I just, I'm just squeezing the gas. So it's not like I'm, I'm on it. And the car just slowly starts kind of pulling to the side and not, not in a scary way or anything, but I'm aware of it and I'm kind of correcting. And I'm like, why is it doing, the... my back wheels are spinning, aren't they? And it's, it's an open diff, so you know, one wheel spins. So just to give you kind of the idea of the, the potential there. <clears throat> so after a number of years, I thought, you know, you get to the end of a build like this and you know so much more than when you started. And there's so many things of, you know, if I was gonna do this again, I would have done this differently and I would do this differently. I had moved out, out to the, I rent, a, I rent a house out in this ranch. I thought, you know, I've got space out here. I don't have neighbors close by to irritate with my angle grinder. Uh, maybe it's time to build another car. And uh, GT40 has always been one of my favorite cars. And so, and I knew I could get a body for one of those. And that meant I didn't have to do a ton of body work. Like I, I don't have the patience to, to just make a body from scratch. The nose was, was enough trouble for me. So I built the GT40 and 
it handles so much better a lot because it's shorter and it's got more weight on the front and it responds to tuning. If it's if it's oversteering, you you soften the, the rear or stiffen the front and it stops oversteering. And if you go too far it understeers and, and, and you you adjust you, you change springs until it works and it just responds so well to the tuning that you make it you can make it easily do whatever it is you want it to do. Also while I was building the GT40 and it was taking longer than I wanted, uh, I took this to some more events and it dawned on me, you know, maybe instead of building a whole new car and creating a whole new set of problems, I should just spend my time making this car fast because that would probably be a lot cheaper. So I decided to improve a few things. I pulled the motor, I put a new cam in it, new solid uh, roller lifters, and, and then I moved the engine mounts. There was a little, there was a gap between the front of the water pump and, and the bulkhead here, the firewall. And so I, I took up that space. I moved the engine an inch forward to help improve weight distribution. I got rid of the stupid bulge in the back and made a structure that just came out behind the gearbox a little bit. I actually, I wanted to get a Boxster gearbox because that's what I'm using the GD40 and I want both cars to be, have the same parts as much as possible. So I, I built the structure with that in mind but I ended up, I didn't want to spend the money at, at that point. So it's still got the same gearbox. But then in the front, I got rid of the rockers I was using and I made my own. And the, the original ones are shaped like this. And what I did was I moved it, I made it so the triangle was at a right angle and that moved the, the wheel back two and a half inches. I put it on the scales and found that put 70 more pounds on the front of the car, it took 70 pounds off the rear of the car. And these rockers, are a little uh, homemade looking. They're just prototype ones. I'm thinking I'm, I wanna try making them again and actually making them so they come back another inch. With these, it handles so much better. I, I, I'm tempted to say, say this is good enough, but there, you've always gotta wonder, hey, can it be even better? Oh, and I painted it green and yellow. My kid had, had since decided he, he thought the GT40 w was cooler when I was building it and then something happened and he decided he hates GT40s and uh, then he liked this car more. He, he got to see the original at an event at Sonoma. We went there specifically because Jim Clark's 38 was there and we got to see it in person, take our pictures with it. He decided, okay, dad, I, I like the 38 better, but you really need to paint it green and yellow. This time when I painted it, I used a similar type of paint that I used on a GD40 and it's single stage. There isn't a clear coat on top. And I did that because that's what the vintage ones look like. That's what they look like in period. And I know stories of the actual 38 at Indy that the, the yellow, uh, they went down to a hardware store and got. So you're gonna need to turn, look this one up, this one up, and this one up. Press the button. There you go. All right, success. Take a first spin. All in all, it's way better now than it used to be. And it's always been better than I ever thought it would be. There's still more to do. I'm still dialing in spring rates, front and rear, but it's a rocket in a straight line. Uh, and it's not, it's not terrible in the corners. It's just open wheel cars tend to be really amazing in the corners. It's definitely been one of the best experiences of my life. Uh, making it, having it work, and getting out there and just having a blast with it. If you're thinking about doing something similar, there's gonna be a second part to this video where I go into more in depth on the details and how I did and, and why I did what I did. And, and this was all with, with you know, hand tools. I had, I had almost nothing when, when I built this car. Uh, I'm hoping I can inspire some of you to go out and do something even better. There's been a long history of me doing things where I go through the effort of just figuring out if it's possible and then somebody sees what I did and goes out and does something that kind of puts my work to shame, but it's so amazing to see that happen. But for now, uh, thanks for watching this and if you want to see more, there will be a part two and there's also the series I did on the GT40 replica I built, so check that out. Thanks.